Okay, welcome to the Wild Side Live. In honor of women, been celebrating all month long with significant women related to the animal control field. And tonight we have one of our favorite regular guests, none other than Dr. Sam. Good evening, Dr. Sam. So nice to be here. Nice to see you again. As everyone knows, Dr. Samantha Wisely is a PhD, a zoonotics expert, uh, University of Florida. You know, one of the things we wanted to talk about tonight, Dr. Sam, and I know you're aware of this because this is what you do. Uh, women only make up about 35% of the STEM workforce. Um, how are we going to fix this? What can we do? Even tonight, this is an interesting topic. How can we get more women interested in this field? Yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, it doesn't, it, it, it's, I think it's what we call a, a leaky pipeline. So women make up more than half of the baccalaureate population. So people who are getting a degree in college. So it's after that, that we're losing them in the STEM sciences. And so I think a lot of that has to do with with decisions about family and the economics of having a family. And, you know, it, it's hard for women to keep stay in the workforce when they're taking care of kids. So how do we balance that? Interesting. So you see, I'm not pushing back. I'm just trying to understand. So you see this as principally a family issue as opposed to an opportunity issue or even a financial issue like this is a this is a lucrative field to get into type of thing yeah i mean i think it's financial in that families have to make financial decisions and and sometimes that makes it hard and women who want to have children it's 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 still really hard to balance having a family and having a career and so finding ways to uh, increase support for that, I think will help a lot. So how, how do we do that? I mean, it's to me, it's such an interesting topic. And I know with some of my own observations, uh, yeah, I think women are very well suited to biology because, you know, let's face it, a lot of women are just very focused and very intelligent. Yeah, I think we've we've have some amazing women scientists out there. It's certainly, um, I think it's a, a matter of opportunity and giving women enough opportunities to do it. But I, I agree. I think having different perspectives on uh, uh, that join the science community makes a difference. What are you seeing in the student body at your university? I mean, what does the distribution look like, men to women? You know, I don't have exact statistics. I'm pretty sure we have more women than men in undergraduate programs, and that's that's true. Now, in certain select fields, that's not true. Like engineering right. is still very much dominated by men. I would say in our wildlife program, it is dominated by women. I, there's still lots of men in the field, but I would say it's probably a 60-40. And uh, even in graduate school, Right, so your post postgraduate degree, so getting a master's or getting a PhD, we still see a fair number of women in those programs, okay. maybe 50, maybe a little less. But then when it's getting into the workforce and particularly in academia, that's when it really drops off. And so I, I you know, I think it a lot of it has to do women are sort of getting at childbearing right. age. And and it's and it's sort of a decision that, that women have to make and that's unfortunate and it, it's changing it's changing slowly uh let's see so 2023 was the first time that the university of florida offered graduate students uh parental leave so that was a big deal for university of florida wow that's great well good Good to University of Florida for doing that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I understand that you were at a vertebrate pest control conference. Is that what it was? 
Yeah, yeah. So the 31st Vertebrate Pest Conference, which is put on by the National Vertebrate Pest Council, has been going for 31 years. This one took place in Monterey, California. Um, and I've been going to them on and off for about 10 years. I find them really, really good conferences. It's a nice mix between um, private industry who's working in the pest control um, business, scientists who are working on better methods for doing control of pests, um, and then regula regulators who are there, you know, what pesticides can you use and what can't okay. you use and what's coming on the okay. market. So it's just a really nice mix of folks. And I always just learn a ton while I'm there. So uh, what are some of your takeaways from the conference? And uh, along those lines, is the principal focus of the conference uh, chemical agents or trapping or both? I think it's every it's it's everything. It's the principles of vertebrate pest control, right? So we have our chemical control, we have behavioral control, okay. right? So people can do things differently in order to reduce the attractance of pests, um, trapping them certainly, euthanizing them. I mean, there's so many different right. aspects to control, and and absolutely, they're they're dedicated to the science oh, of it. That's what's really that is cool, cool about. It. Yeah. So, yeah. So let's see. So overarching themes to me, I think, would be that um, people are using a lot of drones in pest control. Now. Oh, wow. So, yeah, and that's so fascinating. For delivery, delivery of toxicants, delivery of rodenticides. Um, they have little cameras where they can actually pick up either thermal signals of rodents or actually visualizations of rodents. And then they actually, those little drones drop baits exactly where wow. they are. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I thought so too. So they're using those mostly on islands where they're controlling them for endangered species. Right. I mean, Massive scale rodenticides like that are hard to in urban spaces. But having said that, in California and some of the major cities there where there have, you know, where there's always urban rodents, uh, particularly uh, roof rats and Norway rats, they have some amazing campaigns to take care of them. Um, in Alameda, the city of Alameda, which is in the North Bay of California, they actually have a program where they they descend into 8,000 manholes in that city to deliver rodenticide because that's where all those Norway really? rats are from the wow. city. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. I think one of the reasons why they're so worried about rodent control out there is it's just very conducive for the fleas that carry some of some major diseases. So whether it be um, sylvatic plague or scrub typhus, um, some of these diseases that you, you know really take off in urban situations. So they work very hard to control those. So, you know, we were talking about the epidemiological triangle so when we're trying to control the rodents or we're, we're trying to control the, the environment, the vector, what are, we, what are we controlling the host? Yeah, so when we think about the epidemiological triangle, right, it's host, it's environment, and it's the agent. So if there's a disease that we're worried about, we have to control the host, but sometimes controlling the environment does that for us. And so it really is it's a way of looking at it holistically, right? It, sometimes you can't just do one thing, you have to do all three. And in this case, there's actually a fourth agent, right? There's the vector, because these are oftentimes flea-borne diseases and rodents that we worry about. So we're really looking at controlling these rodents because of zoonotic disease. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. In other places, we control them for agricultural reasons, right? Right. Sometimes they'll, they'll they they really get into um, our crops, 
but certainly in urban situations, we're very worried about disease. Did you deal with any of the larger animals like raccoons uh, or any, you know, like in Florida, we're mostly a lot of raccoons, possums, mm -hmm. armadillos. I know there's an insurge, an increase, a surge of diseases related to armadillos happening in Florida right now. There was a lot of talk about feral swine. That's something that you're working on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there, the, the National Feral Swine Damage Management Group was there. They're part of USDA. And um, they had some very interesting talks about African swine fever. Okay. They're very worried about it. I saw maps of risk for African swine fever. So things like how many um, pig operations are in a county, whether it's a port of entry for a count, if a county is a port of entry, that increases the risk. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of pre-planning in case African swine fever should come. I also saw some really cool talks, some very practical talks on how to trap pigs. That absolutely okay. like they're just little things, but they really like did it for me. So state of the art right now is to use these corral traps yes. that have the, uh, the guillotine right. doors and, and you use your cell phone with the webcam on there so you can get an entire sounder all right. at once. But kind of what's a pain in the butt about those is that you, you have to stay up all night watching yeah. your phone, right, until you drop the trap. And so what this one gentleman um, was talking about, he's, I think he's part of the Jaeger Pro uh, group of uh, trap makers, is he gets a deer corn feeder and puts it in there and then puts a timer on it to, let's say, dusk. And so he actually trains those pigs that he wants to trap to come at dusk every night and so you know pre baiting is a huge part of getting a sounder and getting everybody okay. at once and so he pre baits that and he makes he trains those pigs to come in at dusk so that on the day that he actually wants to drop the trap he knows when to check his camera right and so he doesn't have to stay up all night he knows those pigs are coming yeah. at 7 p.m and that bait feeder stops feeding. And the, the, the other part about that is, is I know in my backyard, when I've been trapping pigs, I get raccoons right. eating all my bait, I get deer eating all my bait. And so this is kind of a cool way to, to train the pigs before you trap that them. That is really cool. Pavlov would never have believed that <laughs> behavioral psychology is being used to trap <laughs> wild pigs in Florida. <laughs> 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 that is so cool. Stimulus. That is great. Huh. Anything about raccoons? I mean, um, I'm still, you know, Dr. Sam, I, I, I don't know what it is, but um, people still really believe they can do it themselves. And we talked about yeah. that last week. You know, I spent over $1,000 on the, the prophylactic uh, rabies vaccine. And yeah. I just, you know, did some more research about De La Scarius, you know, and I, for the first time, I've actually seen the worm. Uh, there was a picture on the Internet, and it was, you know, they had a dime on the pictures of point of reference. These worms mm -hmm. are big. This is, uh, you know, so what, what's, what did the conference have to say about raccoons, if anything? Yeah, so I did not see any talks on raccoons. There were a couple of talks on raccoon dogs, which are sort of the dog, Asian yeah. analog of, of, of raccoons. And they're in a, a problem invasive species in Europe. Wow. And, and so there was a talk from Sweden about raccoon dogs and how they're mitigating their effects. 
And I've seen this last summer, I saw um, a talk by a group from Hungary at their major wildlife institute there, and they have raccoon dogs, and they're very worried about them spreading. Is it a raccoon or a dog? <laughs> it's, it's kind of neither and both at the same time. They're, they're like their own wow. thing. Yeah, yeah, they're beautiful. I mean, they're very, they're very attractive okay. animals. I could see why people move them around. Wow. But I think you're absolutely right. I think people have to be really careful about and and be very respectful of raccoons. They are our major rabies vector in this in in the southeast, all throughout the eastern seaboard, actually. And uh, I mean, we get reports weekly of uh, from Florida public health about, uh, you know, zones of Florida that are, are having a rabies outbreak. It, it happens continuously. Is that some kind of uh, notification system that uh, I could subscribe to? I would like to have that information as well. Yeah, that's a good point. So, um, I don't know exactly the answer to that right off the top of the tip of my tongue, but yes, I think they they are public service announcements that come out. Um, they're typically put out by your public health department, or or at least they're filtered through your your public health department. Um, and I bet you you could okay. sign up. Yeah, I think that's very important for nuisance wildlife because, well, we need to know what our risks are at any given time, and. Uh, yeah. I continue to believe that it's my responsibility to tell people who insist that they're going to do it themselves that they're introducing risk. A lot of risk. A lot of risk. They are very spicy animals, yeah. too, right? Yeah, they're tough. Mm -hmm. You know, last week, um, well, it really wasn't last week, a few weeks ago, <clears throat> I had somebody on from my neighborhood a woman that does, uh, I'm going to mess up the acronym, but it's TNVR, uh, Trap, Neuter, Vaccinate, and Release of Cats. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, I was asking her and, you know, her her other trapper friends, you know, what what's your primary concern about feral cats and the types of diseases that you could encounter there? Can you tell us? You know, what are, what are our risks in dealing with community cats, as they're called? Yeah. Well, um, I think rabies is a big one. In places where they do have trap, vaccinate, neuter, and release, that vaccination is almost always for rabies. Um, but cat, feral cats are the number two rabid animal that gets reported to Department of Public Health in Florida oh. behind raccoons. Um, and they're right about even with bats. And bats is an endemic reservoir. Um, and cats are not an endemic reservoir. So this is all spillover from typically raccoons into cats. And then it just starts circulating in those cats because they're in such high density. And because to people think of them as companion animals, right? right? There's just a lot of human interaction <laughs> with those feral cats. So, so definitely rabies is a big one. Um, you and I, before the show started, talked about cat scratch fever. Right. Um, so that's a bacteria that lives on the surface of animal of, of cats and it, it, if it lives under their nails. And if they scratch you, that bacteria gets into you and it can cause a very serious infection. I had a, um, a biological scientist working for me and her, her companion cat, not, not a feral cat, this was a cat that lived in her oh, home. Really? She, she got a very deep scratch from her animal and she, her hand was a mess for a long time. She had to go to the doctor, she went to the emergency room. So, and, and this disease is what we call Bartonella, correct? It's Bartonella. It's one of the Bartonellas. There's multiple okay. of them, but yeah, it is a Bartonella. There's another flea-borne Bartonella that people worry about in Florida too, and I've seen um, uh, we've seen a few cases of that um, in, in Florida. So you're saying that the top three uh, 
hosts for rabies, is that correct? Is the raccoon, the domestic cat, or the companion, the uh, community cat, and bats in that order? Well, so I guess I would, I would, um, I would at least give bats and raccoons a different designation okay. because it's endemic in those two populations. They they circulate the rabies virus on their own, and they have a bat strain of rabies in bats and a raccoon strain of rabies in raccoons. What typically happens with raccoons is when they become rabid, they can actually go and bite other species okay. of animals. And so it gets into cats quite readily and then starts circulating there. And, and just because I think raccoons and cats, they live in very similar habitats. They, they often interact in people's backyards. It's one of the reasons why we see so many cats get infected with rabies. I just heard a story that's kind of a warning to not only trappers, but to Airbnb hosts. Apparently... Um the Airbnb host paid a trapper to remediate a bat problem in the attic. At least I think that's what happened, or maybe it was a failed do-it-yourself job. But it was not successful, and the, the attic was littered with half-dead and dead bats. And yeah. uh, I, the Airbnb guest came into contact with a dead bat, and uh, well, here come the lawyers. Here come the lawyers because you know concern about exposure to rabies. Sure. I'm sure whoever Absolutely. attempted to remediate those bats is in the line of fire. Yeah. For the most part, Absolutely. I'm not an expert in bats, but for the most part, as I understand it, we don't we don't kill bats, right? We let them escape. And we keep them from coming back. Absolutely. Yeah, bats are such an important part of the environment, right? We live in Florida where we have mosquitoes and we have mosquito-borne diseases for people that we really want all the species that takes care of mosquitoes. Right. And so that's why we have laws, right? I mean, there's certain times there where you can mitigate and not mitigate for bats in roofs. And that is why exclusions are so important but they have to be done correctly they have to be you have to make sure there's nobody in there if they're in there you have to remove them you have to follow the laws about when you can do it right. and absolutely it takes a professional without a absolutely doubt. it's not something that people should be trying to do themselves uh, you're just exposing yourself to a lot of problems both in terms of running afoul of the law and getting injured potentially. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So we talked about the Bartonella. I've got to put my glasses back on. The Bartonella CSD, and that's the uh, cat scratch disease. But you know, we also wanted to talk about this leptospirosis. Did I say that correctly? Leptospirosis. leptospirosis. So mm -hmm. leptospirosis is a disease we can get from dirty water, correct? Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. the cautionary tale here is, well, we get flooding in Florida all the time from heavy rains or from hurricanes. Are we ex people that want to go out and play in that muddy, dirty water, are they putting themselves at risk? Yeah, I absolutely think so. And it's not just leptospirosis. So. To begin with, so leptospirosis is a concern, and anytime there's flooding in in places, we see an increase of leptospirosis. So it's it's transmitted in the urine of a lot of mammal species, and so and it can be transported in water quite easily. So absolutely, that's a huge concern. But I think even a bigger concern is when storm water. Um, facilities get overwhelmed, when storage uh, ponds get overwhelmed, all of a sudden you get a lot of human sewage running through those systems after a hurricane. And that increases the likelihood of disease from all sorts of things. So really, really staying out of those, those waters, um, those floodwaters, if you can at all avoid it, is 
huge. Right, because all that flood water is overwhelming the sewer system, and it's you might not know it, but it's coming up through the sewer system from upstream water pressure. Exactly, exactly. But we wouldn't consider getting sick from human feces a zoonotic, right? The, it would just be leptospirosis in this case. Yeah, yes, I would think that's true, yep. Another thing I learned, because I, I try to do a lot of research before I talk to you, because, well, I'm trying to keep up, Dr. Sam. <laughs> uh, you keep me busy trying to figure out what all these things are. I didn't know this, but maybe you can help us understand. We talked about Balascarius. I had somebody call me about there was two raccoons defecating in their pool. I said, I can do that job, and this is how much. His response was, well, we don't use the pool anyway, which I thought was very strange, okay? You basically have a 5,000-gallon Petri dish in the backyard, but hey, whatever. We don't go in there. But what I heard, and hopefully uh, you can bring some truth to this, is that dogs can actually become contaminated with Balascarius because dogs eat feces sometimes, or they eat other things that could be contaminated with this roundworm. Mm -hmm. And they can actually become, they can seed the environment through their own feces. Is that correct? You know, I, I, I don't know about whether or not they can continue the life cycle. My understanding of, um, of this worm is that it's pretty specific to raccoons in order to complete the life cycle. So when it completes the life cycle, that's when it comes out in the feces. It lays those eggs in the environment. If the raccoon picks it back up, then it completes that life cycle again and it gets pooped out. Where the problem is, is when that, that, that egg that, that's in the feces gets picked up by any other species besides raccoon, it, the egg hatches in that body, but it doesn't know where to go because it's not a raccoon. And so it starts migrating oh, into very different places. Right. And it doesn't complete its life cycle, but like in humans, it can insist in the brain and cause very significant problems in the brain, in other major organs, and it can cause a lot of damage in the organs. Basically, it's looking for a way to get out, right? It thinks it's in a raccoon and it's not. And so that's true of a lot of other, it can make dogs very sick and it can make cats very sick. So I think that's one thing I know about. Now, whether they can complete the life cycle, I'm not actually sure about. Interesting. So the roundworm actually lives as a worm in the intestine of the raccoon? Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then those worms shed eggs into the, through the feces, and that's how the life cycle continues. And is this a kind of a parasite situation where those worms will continue to habitate? that animal or will they eventually overwhelm it? That's a good question. Do raccoons die of the infection? I, you know, I think raccoons live a pretty hard life. And so I suspect they probably don't live long enough to die from that infection. But it'd be interesting to know if, if a long lived raccoon suffers from more worms than others. I don't think they would clear it. I think they would, they would just keep growing in population numbers. I have another situation that I've donated some money to a local rehabber mm -hmm. because I get calls for sick animals. I don't, I don't take sick animals. I don't have the wherewithal to handle a sick animal. I don't have the experience, the knowledge. So I follow this person on Facebook and I've encouraged her to come to your the podcast with you because I think she's a little bit too relaxed around the raccoons that come into her yard and uh, we talked about this a little bit in the past I think we run into trouble when we view all living things as cuddly pets instead of them being distinct animals with you know their own lives their own 
diseases, they're not pets, they're not meant to be touched, they're not meant to be, you know, brought into your yard and, and treated like, you know, a human baby. Yeah, yeah, it's hard. It's a fine line, right, between loving wildlife and loving individual animals of wildlife. And I think we do have to be really cautious about that because even if animals become acclimated or accustomed to humans, you never know when that switch will flip, right? And they'll become wild again and injure a human. Um, so beside, you know, so that's just mechanical damage, right? To a, an attack by wildlife. Um, a bite from wildlife, which then, of course, can lead into really serious disease concerns. Well, you bring up an interesting point because we all know the stories, right? The uh, woman, I don't know if she was in California, but she went to visit her friend who has an ape that she was familiar with. Well, the ape just went feral and just tore her apart. Yeah. Then... Uh, I just put a story on my Facebook page about a man who had a wild boar as a pet. And one day the wild boar decided that that man was going to be dinner. It doesn't matter that, the, that he raised him. You know, it's not a domesticated animal, so it's not going to work that way. Yeah, it takes thousands of years, right, right to domesticate animals, living with humans and breeding them to be that way. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. Those animals are not domestic, and they're not pets. And I'm sure you heard about and, the man in Miami that had a pet jackal. Uh, no. How do you think that went when that jackal got, <laughs> you know, those, Not well. Those animals have jaws. They can just, they can pulverize your femur. They're just the most powerful. Yeah. Well, that's what happened. That snapped the guy's leg, and... Uh, so not only was he seriously injured, he was in a bit of trouble for having a uh, that animal in his condo. I can't even imagine. Who does that? <laughs> uh, what are you thinking? I... <laughs> yeah, that is incredible. They, they are powerful animals. Yeah, it, it's just amazing that, you know, you just cannot take an animal from the wild and he's going to become your pet. There was one more thing I wanted to talk to you that was more academic. And that's the three routes of exposure. Because we always talk about, okay, PPE, PPE, and PPE. you got to cover our eyes. you got to cover our mouth and our nose. But, you know, when we're, we also need to cover our bodies, right? Because we don't want to carry something back to the car and then back to the house and then back to the pets and back to the kids. So can we talk about the three routes of exposure and how we can better prepare ourselves by understanding that? Yeah, so I, I think when it comes to PPE, I think that... Um, just knowing that, you know, your your skin is a protective device, okay. right? I mean, that's why we have it on us. And there's certain places where we don't have it. And you named a bunch of them, right? Your eyes, your nose. So breathing it in via your mouth. But also if you have a break in your skin, and that's why it's so important to wear gloves, right? If you break that natural protection that you have, um, that is another route that, that you can be exposed by. Um, yeah, I, I just can't say enough about it. And, you know, in terms of clothing, you know, you can wear disposable right. things. The Tyvek, like, painter's suit. You know, you just throw it away when you're done. Absolutely. And, I mean, I think if you're in, a, in an attic situation where you're just going to get the dust of of rodents and, and, or pigeons or, you know, any of the, any feces on you. And it's, you're in a tight and closed situation besides having good respiratory uh, protection. I think, I think that's a case for Tyvex. So we talked about inhalation. Uh, we talked about exposure to of the mucous membranes to the pathogens, mm -hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And we talked about possible injection or coming through broken skin. Absolutely. 
So when we're talking about PPE, these are these are the things we're trying to protect from happening. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So some sort of glasses or protective gear there as well, I think is super important. So after our last podcast, I did get the full face respirator. You know, mm -hmm. pretty much starts up here, covers the face, has the, you know, the dual valves. Because, you know, when you're in the attic, which I typically don't do, but when you are, you're, it's just such a dusty environment and all that feces is contained in there, you have to have your eyes and your nose completely, the mucous membranes completely protected, correct? Yeah, I think that's true. Any crawl space like that where you would expect to see a lot of bats, rodents, birds, I think it's just super important that you're, you, you are, you've got all three of those bases covered. Sorry, I seem to have lost sound. Can you hear me? I can okay. now. Sorry about that. I wanted to share something. Um, I don't know how I went ahead and did that. You may be familiar with this and maybe you could tell us more about it. Is that you? <laughs> That's <All right>. me. <laughs> so you're preventing the next coronavirus in Florida. Can you tell us how you're doing that? There's another cool picture of you down here. Yeah, so um, we, I've um, worked with uh, Dr. Um, Casey Young um, uh, on a number of different projects. Um, so we've done a fair bit of surveillance for coronaviruses in different species. Um, we've looked for them in white-tailed deer. We've looked for them in um, a few other species. Not myself, but other people at University of Florida have looked for them in bats. Okay. Um, and so the thing about coronaviruses that are, that's really interesting is that they mix and match. They really um, take a little bit of a coronavirus from this animal, and they'll take a little bit of coronavirus from this animal they'll mix it up and they'll make a new coronavirus. And then the human body does, has never seen it before because it looks like a completely new virus. And so they're just very easy to get transmitted from one species to another because of that property. And so that's one of the reasons why we worry so much about coronaviruses. You know, before you've came on, I didn't realize the coronavirus is actually zoonotic. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There are a ton of coronaviruses in bats. Um, we see them, they're, they're, they're actually super ubiquitous. You see them in lots of different species. Um, and so I think that's what worries people is that if a bat specific coronavirus mixes with a pig specific coronavirus that it creates this new coronavirus that no species ever ha has ever seen and it can start uh spreading quite quickly uh yeah so in my mind i'm trying to understand you've got two different coronaviruses existing in the same host how do they become a third mm -hmm. one what is that mechanism? Yeah, so they take the best bits of both, right? It's called recombination or sometimes called reassortment, depends on the type of virus, whether it's coronavirus or influenza. And so they can, by different ways, they sort of take the best of both worlds and create a superbug oh, out of that. That's so incredibly wild. 
<laughs> I mean, viruses don't breed the way animals do. So how do they? And they're not do. They're not technically living things, are they? Yeah, they're so amazing. Yeah, they're. I mean, you have to have respect for them. So there are bits of nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA, and what they do is when they get into the host, when they get into the mammal or the reptile or the bird, they actually commandeer those cells and make them replicate the virus instead of do whatever it else it, that those cells would do otherwise. So they use the machinery of the host to make more of themselves. I don't want to get too complicated, and if I'm asking a question that makes no sense, please tell me because I'm not a biologist, although it was my favorite class in high school. We got to dissect a pig <laughs> and everything. It was great. Ladies, <laughs> do it. It's awesome. Uh, <clears throat> so does the virus supplant the DNA in the cell? Is that how it is able to... Uh, it doesn't need to. No, it just, it takes the machinery. It takes what makes like ATP and, and the mitochondria. And it, it, uh, it just, it takes all the other things. It doesn't have to, it doesn't need the, the, the genome of the animal. It, it actually just takes the machinery that, 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 that cell would use otherwise to, to make stuff. So it, it makes more copies of its DNA. It makes more copies of a shell of itself so it can go forth in the environment and infect other things. Are you familiar with the concept of transpermia? No. It's the, the theory that it's possible that life on Earth originated from other planets. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking about this incredibly weird biology of these viruses, it sounds like something that could have landed here on a rock. Well, I, it's got to be something that's very simple, right. right? You know, it's like a precursor of life. So, yeah, I think you're not too far off, right? It, they're very simple. They're, they're elegant, okay. right, in their simplicity. And so, yeah, I think that's, that's not too far from a, a, a good idea. It's just so strange. <laughs> Uh, yeah. A friend of mine is a chemist, you know, and we were having a faux debate about whether viruses are alive or not alive. It was just fun. I don't know the answer. I don't even know enough to really entertain the question, but they're not alive, correct? Yeah, I mean, if you consider um, life to be encapsulated in a cell, then no, they're not technically alive, but they have a drive. There's selection on them, you know, so they are, they're right at the edge, right? They behave, they're, they're, they're precursors to life. I think the way you explained it wow. is great. So the medicines that we take, you know, when we first get sick, you know, you have a very short window to take this medicine for it to be effective, uh, like a flu virus or whatever. How does that work? How does how do these drugs that you take right, you know, you go to the doctor, they swab your nose, okay, go get this prescription, flow, I don't even know the name of it, but it's like a virus, antiviral pill that you take. How does that yeah. work? I'm not a medical doctor. I really, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you the answer to that. Um, yeah. It's interesting, right? Very interesting. Very interesting. And, you know, the way medical doctors tr and veterinarians treat bacterial infect infections is very different than the way they treat viral infections. I mean, the one thing I do know about viruses is that very often it's, not the virus that kills you sometimes it is but it's your body's reaction to the virus right, right? that's very true with coronaviruses it's this over response of your body that's overreacting to this virus being there that gets you into trouble so you know the the whole idea with the bacterial infection wasn't this the louis pasteur introduce you know a dead part of this bacteria in your body will develop a, a reaction to it, correct? How does that work? Yeah, so the whole idea so the whole idea of antibodies and those were sort of the the original 
um, vaccines, right. right? So, so bacteria have very specific uh, keys, let's say, on on the surface of them that fits into the lock of your cells. And when that that key fits the lock, it opens it up. But what your body does is it recognizes that key sometimes. And so your white blood cells rush in with antibodies that fit that, right? And they overwhelm that response. So they recognize it and then neutralize it. And so those are, that that is the main way that, that bacteria are defeated mm -hmm. in, in vertebrates. With corona, they developed a new vaccine right there's a brand new type of vaccine for corona was that was that what we did yeah we did i don't know so those are called messenger rna vaccines and i don't know that much about them except that they were a, a new class of vaccine that that uh, were used for people very interesting uh, it's such a fascinating field it really is yeah, and it's changing so rapidly. You know, the area of zoonotics is interesting because it, it seems like, just like we're talking with these viruses combining and creating something new, it seems like there will be a, forever a new zoonotic disease. There will always be something either we're finding, you know, the last time we talked about Marburg and we talked about uh, that type of hemorrh hemorrhagic disease. And y your field just seems like there'll be an infinite amount of things to study. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with you. You know, we're, there are a lot of humans on this planet and we come into contact with a lot of wildlife. And uh, as long as that keeps happening, I think I think we will keep having uh, pandemics like this. And it's not just people coming into contact with with wildlife, but it's also how I mean we, our global transportation system. You know, I can end up in Asia right. tomorrow, right? It's delightful. It's wonderful. But it also allows those the viruses that we carry to get transported globally overnight mm -hmm. as well so yeah i i think i think they're here and um i think you know we need to think hard about how we want to respond to them and uh whether we're willing to share the burden of risk or whether we want to go it alone um, there's a lot of pushback to, to the government wanting to protect people as a population and t taking away some of our individual rights to do that. And I think to Are you talking about like anti-vaccine? Anti-vaccine and anti-mask and anti-mask. Anti yeah. And I, I get it. I get that, that people want to have their individual rights for sure. But, you know, sometimes you got to think about whether you want to do that for the good of the community or not. And, you know, the, the, the COVID outbreak, while it was huge and it went around the world, it wasn't that virulent of a, of a virus. The next one could be much more virulent and kill a lot more people. And I think we'll need to think carefully about whether or not we're, we're willing to... Uh, sacrifice some some convenience and some rights to save a lot of people yeah, and i thought about the same thing if another virus like that comes through and it's much more demonstrably dangerous and fatal i think a lot fewer people will be resistant to protecting themselves but as you know as a floridian you know we've got an outbreak of measles here uh yes we do now that's not zoonotic, correct? It is not. Okay. But, you know, we had a perfectly good vaccine that people have been taking for a long time that was very effective. And now 
you know, we've kind of opened the door, you know, they say, you know, once the camel's head gets in the tent, I, I think, are we at that point now? I think we'll see, you know, I think, I think if enough children get sick that, that hopefully the tides will turn. I mean, I certainly hope it doesn't come to that, but, um, you know, we have people in charge that are saying that the vaccine either is not effective or is dangerous. And that goes against all convention that we right. know about the measles vaccine. And so I just, I really, I, 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 my sincere wish is that no children get sick and die. That's, that's really all I can say about that. Well, you, I don't know if you heard, but the longest living person in an iron lung just died. Have, were you aware of that gentleman? Mm -mm. You can see him on YouTube. He, there are videos of him. He lived practically his entire life in an iron lung. Wow. As a child, he got polio, mm -hmm. and uh, he even got a law degree in the you know while living on his back in an iron lung. Wow! You don't think we're going to get to that point again, do you? I hope not. <laughs> Yeah, I hope not. I, 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 it worries me to see us moving a little bit backwards on, on pathogens that should have been vanquished and be gone a long, long time ago. Yeah, and these are the easy shots. I mean, this isn't difficult. These things, you know, uh, I'm not sure if we're the same age. You're probably a lot younger. But when I was a kid, they just lined you up outside the school and you pulled down your shirt and they had... It was almost like this air gun and just bam, that was it. You went on your way. There wasn't yeah. any question about this because everybody was old enough to remember what it was like before the vaccine. Well, and everybody knew somebody with polio. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. absolutely. So nobody dicked around. You just got in line and wham, and that was it. Yeah. There was no time to cry and fuss. We won't be having any of that. This was the 70s. You're just going to get your shot and get on with it. And that's what everyone did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I really hope, I, I really hope everybody's okay. That that's in that area. It would be ironic if other countries started banning Floridians from travel because, well, we don't want that stuff in here. <laughs> <laughs> your passport gets flagged. You're trying to get in China. Nope. Back on the plane. <laughs> right? That could happen. Why why not? Why could that not happen? Are there reasons why that could not happen, Dr. Sam? Well, I mean, I know when I go to certain countries, they make sure that I am vaccinated for certain things and they won't let you in the country if you're not, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're gonna go to East Africa, you gotta be vaccinated for yellow fever. And okay other places and they won't they simply won't let you in the country but that's an individual thing right you've got your vaccine card but yeah, yeah. absolutely I, I i wouldn't let anybody into my country if they didn't have a measles vaccine i mean that's that's it's that's, highly contagious right you just have to is, walk by is, somebody it is the most contagious virus there is so obviously that was not eradicated. Is polio eradicated by definition at this point? You know, the, I, 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 no, I don't think it is. I think it's still, there are still some, some countries that are war torn where it's still hanging on. I want to say Afghanistan is one of them where there's still some cases that they're seeing because it's very hard to get everybody vaccinated right. there. So it, it could come back yeah, if come people back. aren't vaccinated. Yeah. I know we're straying a little far from zoonics, but <laughs> yeah. are we, uh, you know, we had all that stuff as a kid. I remember drinking the little sweet brown liquid for my polio. Uh, are we still protected all these years on? Or is it the herd immunity that's doing it? Yeah, so um, I don't know the answer to that specific. I don't know how long those polio vaccines last. I think I did read just the other day in the Washington Post, they were talking about the measles vaccine and that it does confer lifelong immunity to you. Um, 
but but yeah it's a combination of both right you know how long do you as an individual have immunity but herd immunity is a huge thing right right well, you, you want to have enough people vaccinated so it can't move around the population right is tetanus a zoonotic disease? Uh, uh, or is that just yeah, something I mean, you pick up from dirt or the environment? Yeah, I think it's more environmental. Although I know that if you've been bit by a wild animal, the first thing they do is give you a tetanus shot. So, um, so I, I, yeah, I mean, I think it's you know almost zoonotic, right? I mean, you've got you've got you've got something foreign in your skin. You're almost always going to get a tetanus shot. Right, and that's good for what ten years, mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, we know about my prophylactic vaccination, and the nurse said that if you get your titers checked, you'll know if you need to get another. What are titers? So we talked a little bit before about homologous antibodies. So these and this lock and key mechanism, and so. Right in your body now, you have circulating antibodies to rabies. And so if that rabies comes into contact with you, your body's going to see it. Now, you, if, if you do get bit and if you do have the prophylactic shot, you still have to get a booster. And, and there's a series of them you have to get after you've been bit, even if you have the prophylactic vaccine. So let's just be super clear about that. But that's how it works, right? It, you're giving your system a head start if, for you, if you get prophylactic rabies because rabies can come on so quickly, right? So you just want your body to be as primed as possible. So if you get that, um, if you do get exposed to rabies, you have the absolute best chance possible of beating it. So what, what do they recommend? How often you get these titers tested every 10 years, 20 years? I think it depends on your level of exposure. So as a researcher at the University of Florida working with carnivores, they want to test me every six months. What? And I don't, and I don't know what the level of my titer is. I, I, don't, I don't recall what that mm -hmm. threshold is before you need to get a booster. But if it's below that, then they need to reboost me every six months yeah that's the university of florida we're highly regulated and that's you know with like monthly handling of raccoons if you're handling them that regularly you want to know what your titers are right of and course I think, you know if you if you if you get a sense for if they're staying the same maybe you can do it a little less frequently but i think you want to know if you've right. got a titer for rabies for sure What's going on now with leprosy and these uh, armadillos? I, I heard that's really on the rise. Yeah, I haven't seen point. numbers for 2023 yet, but you know, the Florida Department of Health held a big symposium at the University of Florida uh, earlier this year um, to raise awareness for it and um, to help people understand. You know, there's there's not a ton of cases in Florida, so like you know, in the tens, there's, you know, maybe less than 20, but there's still a number of cases, but they're so very concentrated. Most of them are happening in Broward County. Wow. And, and so, you know, there is a little focus of, of disease happening there. Um, and I think that they're trying to do some, some wildlife studies there to get a better handle on what the prevalence of, of the pathogen is in armadillos there. There was an article that just came out about the monkeys that we talked about in with Silver Spring, or sure, yeah, and about herpes B, and uh, you know, it was one of these uh, articles about invasive species in Florida, mm -hmm. and the author, well, whether they were being genuine or not, or just for the sake of the article, was quite surprised about these monkeys and how this disease was an issue in these monkeys. Yeah, and, and I'm surprised they were surprised. I mean, macaques are notorious for having herpes B, and it, my lab went out and tested those monkeys, and indeed they do have herpes B. Wow. There is no doubt about it. So, uh, yeah, they have it, and, you know, it's not an insignificant prevalence that we found. It was like between 
seven percent in some of the so there at, at least the time we did the study there were four separate um groups of, of monkeys and one of them was almost at 30 percent wow yeah that's amazing it is amazing and terribly frightening i think right you know people people come into really close contact with those monkeys on Silver Springs River. They need to watch some YouTube videos because I see all these tourists in India just getting mauled by these monkeys. Whatever's in your bag, and if you're not giving it to them, they're taking your bag. And if they have oh, to take absolutely. you down to get that bag off your body, they're doing it. They're super aggressive, yeah. yeah. You know, you, you mentioned some of the really, tangentially, you mentioned some cool things that you do. Tell us more. I mean, let's really <laughs> inspire women to get in this field. You talk about <laughs> handling raccoons all day and going to Silver Spring to catch some monkeys. I mean, this is, and you're stopping coronavirus. You need a cape. Somebody sent for a cape. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I love my job. I have the best job in the world. Wow. Um, yeah, it's super fun. Being a professor at the University of Florida has, has been a real kick. And do you spend a lot of time in the lab or teaching? Where are you? In the, and what's your days look like? Yeah, so um, I don't have a teaching appointment. My appointment is research and extension. So conducting the science so we can better understand what's going on with zoonotic diseases. But then extension at the University of Florida and other land grant universities is then translating that science for the public. And for me, that's one of the favorite things that I do, like making science accessible. Because if it just stays siloed and in a scientific paper, what's, what's the point? Right. If it doesn't so that's super interesting because we always hear about the extension service. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is that an extension service for the university is almost like a public outreach. Absolutely, it is. That's Absolutely. what it is. It is a public outreach. Absolutely, yeah. So whether it's helping citrus growers combat uh, citrus greening, or livestock producers or nuisance animal trappers, or the general public, 4-H, uh, things like 4-H oh, occur yeah. in extension. That's part of extension service. So yeah, it's a huge program. And it's in Florida, we are so lucky that it is so well supported. We're, we are. University of Florida Extension is in every single county of Florida helping Floridians. Wow. And as a consumer of your fine work, how do I how do I use extensions? Is there websites or there papers, a repository of written work? How do I take advantage of that as a trapper here in Pinellas County? Yeah, so um, there's you're absolutely right. There's lots of written material. So if you go to if you Google University of Florida Extension. And um, our main way of transmitting information to the public is called an electronic document information service. That's, and the acronym is EDIS, E-D-I-S. Okay. okay. You will find a plethora of information on all sorts of things. And there's lots of information about trapping wild animals um, in our EDISes. And it has a searchable database for everything that you need. Um, oftentimes, it, it's sort of county dependent, but oftentimes um, county extension agents will be very well versed in um, trapping particular types of animals. And really? Lots of nuisance animals. Yeah. So, all right, I'm thinking of the extension service and I'm thinking of Florida Wildlife Control. How do you guys work together as agencies or uh, is there a connection there between these agencies? Yeah, so I think more and more there there are, and there's there's really good programs. So um, right now, I think that there's almost nationwide. I think I would call it there's certain states that are really starting to do this. But let's say for feral swine, the USDA Wildlife Services is very interested in kind of teaching people how to trap wild pigs on their own property. 
And so there's sort of a translation of that science okay. to extent, extension agencies, to extension folks. And then other parts of USDA are providing funds so people can buy what you would call like a community trap. Oh. And it's a, it's a loan program. Okay. And, and so those extension agents can loan out a trapping system to say an HOA or to a rancher if they want to get rid of any nuisance animals. Really? That's interesting. I did not know that. Yeah, it's just starting to get started. The, the pilot program that I know about in Florida is in sort of the Red Hills Panhandle area. Okay. And I think it's been very successful. That's really interesting to know because I do get calls for swine and I do get calls for coyotes. But, you know, Florida Wildlife Commission is not very happy about leg hold traps and for good reason you know kids can get in there or domestic pets and before you know it everyone's on the sidewalk putting you on TikTok, trying to get the pet out of the trap it's not a good look yeah yeah so to get the to get the swine trap that you talked about uh you know those are very expensive you're looking mm -hmm. at like fifteen hundred dollars got to get all the stakes and all the netting and all the gates uh coyote trap six hundred dollars so I wonder if I could leverage an opportunity like this to help an HOA, for example, deal with a swine problem. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great idea, and I think, you know, I, I think it takes I it, it, I think it's going to take sort of a, a network of people to make this work, right? So it's going to mm -hmm. take nuisance trappers working with sort of the whoever the authorizing agent is. And I think it's very different in different states. Sometimes okay. it's the game commission and sometimes it's USDA. Uh, sometimes it's the extension service. So I don't, in, in this particular case in uh, the Red Hills, um, it is USDA that's loaning out those traps. But I think I've seen, I've seen other states actually, when I was at the vertebrate pest conference, I've seen other states where it works differently, where the state agency is the one that's taking the lead. So stay tuned. I think that that's something in our future for sure in Florida. Are you familiar with, and uh, I know we're running out of time, so I won't keep you much longer, but I had a question about this system. Uh, let me share this. See what you know about this. I really need to put my glasses back. <laughs> I put my glasses on and then you see reflection in them. That's why I take them off. Are you familiar with this? It's called EDD Maps. Yeah, I love that website. Because I've been using this when I catch, you know, invasives here in Pinellas County. Oh, I'm so glad to hear it. And I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll fill it out to the best that I can with a photograph. I did, uh, uh, you know, I'm in here. So if you look me up, you'll see I did bufos. Are you familiar with those horrible things? Yes. The bufo toad. <laughs> the frog that barks. I mean, that thing is awful. And then uh, also iguanas because... I caught some iguanas here in Pinellas County, and I recognize that we have iguanas endemic to Florida now, but I caught one in a very weird location. I'm not convinced that somebody decided just to get rid of their pet. Mm -hmm. So I, I did document that because I thought it would be important to know that in this neighborhood, you know, I pulled out this very large iguana. Wow. So what do you think? That's a good thing to do, right? Because it provides a body of knowledge and research for people like you, right? I absolutely agree. And I think we call a lot of those websites driven by citizen science, right? Where right. you can make a difference, even if you're not a scientist, by, you know, adding to the data stream. So EdMaps is great. iNaturalist is another one that's really good. But EdMaps is wonderful for invasive species. Um, we used that if you actually go and look at um reese's macaques 
Um, there's amazing sightings of Reese's macaques, and they're up in Tallahassee. They're Hello. over in Orlando. They're over by Tampa. I mean, they are more than just in Silver Springs. Who who manages that? It's a university, correct? Ed Maps. Uh, I think it's Cornell University, but I'm not exactly sure. I think you're right, though. Let's see. Ed Maps. Uh... University of Georgia. University of Georgia. Center for Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health at the University of Georgia. There you go. Launched in 2005. But you know, they also do plants. Mm-hmm. I uh, mean, with, invasive plants in Florida are a disaster. I'm only familiar with the Brazilian, the Brazilian pepper. pepper. Right. Yeah. yeah. I'm not a, lot of, a lot of our invasive species that do damage Plant species are aquatic invasive species. Right. Do you have that tree that makes great mulch uh, in the Everglades? Which one is that? I don't think I know. Yeah. It's a competitor of your native, you know, aquatic type trees in the Everglades. And this one is invasive. I, I don't remember the name, but that's interesting. Well, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, my Dr. pleasure. Wisely. This is always so fascinating. And hopefully we can get more women, young women, and interested in STEM and biology. Yeah. I, honestly, it was my best, my favorite class <laughs> in high school. It was so kind of definitely. unfair because we had a brand new wing in our high school. It was kind of a rural high school, but we had a brand new wing and we had a brand new lab you know, with all the big desks and, you know, the water services and the microscopes and, yeah, and the teacher was great, you know. People, you always remember your good high school teachers, and this teacher was really good, and I, I really I a, learned a lot. I had a really good biology teacher, too, in high school. It made all the difference for me. Yeah, so thank you, and uh, yeah. I hope you'll come back. Would you do that, please? Anytime. All right, Dr. Sam. That's it for the Wild Side tonight. Take care, everyone. Good night.